Welcome to this tutorial. In this video, we're going to create this responsive portfolio website with Next.js, TypeScript and Tailwind CSS. This portfolio website contains the hero section with the social media icons. Then we have here the nav bar. We have also a contact button. If we click on it, a modal opens up where we have a contact form. And here we can enter a message, click on send message, which then will be sent to an actual email. Here we have the about section and a timeline, which is then followed by the project section with some project cards. The navbar is also always accessible. If we hover over it, it will appear. And at last we have here the services section, where we also have the contact button, which again shows the contact form if we click on it. And here we have the footer. This is the layout for mobile devices. So the content adjusts to the smaller screen size. Everything is still readable. And we also have a burger menu here in the top right. If we click on it, we have access to all of our menu items. And here we also have access to the contact button, which again shows the contact form. Once we're finished, we also will deploy this web app to Versal. Right now I have it already running here. So this is already accessible through the web. Now for this tutorial, I'm using Windows 11 with Visual Studio Code and the Ubuntu subsystem. If you have already a working setup, feel free to skip this section, otherwise stay tuned. For Visual Studio Code, I am using two extensions. The first one is called WSL, which allows me to connect Visual Studio Code to the Ubuntu subsystem. And the second one is called VS Code Icons, which can make the navigation through your project structure easier. Now, in order to install the Ubuntu subsystem, you have to hit the Windows key, search for features, optional features. Then you click on it, scroll down to the bottom. There you select more Windows features. You scroll down to the bottom again and activate Windows subsystem for Linux. This will probably require a few restarts. And if it's finished, you can simply go to the Microsoft store, search for WSL. There are a few versions available. Personally, I'm using this one here. And if everything is set up correctly, you can go back to Visual Studio Code and we click here on the bottom left on this blue button. This will open a few options here on the top where it says connect to WSL. This will open a new window. We can already see here it says connected to remote. We can open any folder on our Ubuntu subsystem, for example, a Git repository and work on it. Here on the bottom, we also have the terminal so we don't need to have another separate window. Right now we are in the root directory. The first thing we're going to do is to clone a Git repository. I've already created one here on GitHub and it's called Next.js. You can simply create your own Git repository by going here to the top, press on this plus icon and select new repository. There you can give the repository a name and set it to public and add a readme, a git ignore and also a license. And then you can create the repository. Then you click on code. Here you have the URL for the Git repository, which we can then clone. In order to clone the Git repository, we need to make sure that Git is also installed. We simply install it by entering the following command, sudo apt install git all. And when this is done, we can simply clone our empty git repository, git clone and the link to our repository. We can then open this one here in Visual Studio Code. It's called Next.js template. We hit on OK. Now we can create our Next.js application. Before we do that, we also need to make sure that Node, the JavaScript environment is installed on our system. We first need to install the node version manager. Then we need to reopen our terminal. We can go here on the top, click on terminal, new terminal, and now NVM is ready to go. So we can install the node version 20, which is the most recent LTS version of node. It also installs the package manager NPM. Node is right now on the version 20. Now with that, we can actually create our next JS application. We simply enter the following command, npx create next app at latest. And this will ask us a few questions like the project name. I will simply call it portfolio. If we are going to use 
TypeScript. Yes, if we want to use Aslint, I will say yes, but we won't be using it for this project. And we want to use the framework Tailwind CSS. Yes, again, and we also want to use the app router, but we won't be using the import alias. And now it's creating our next JS application. Now it's done. We can see here the portfolio folder. We can click on it and we can see our next JS application here. We need to change to the portfolio project folder here. And then we can simply run this next JS application by entering npm run dev. This will start the project on localhost port 3000. We open it in the browser and there we go. Let's have a look at the project structure. So at first glance, we have here a lot of files. Let's start with the next folder here. So this one is basically the folder where all the files during a build process are stored. So every time we are creating a production build, all those files are stored in the .next folder. The production build contains actually all the files that are also deployed on the server. Then we have here the node modules folder. This folder contains all our modules or libraries and other dependencies that are right now installed and used in our Next.js application. This is the public folder, which should contain all of our assets and images. So for example, if you are using an image for some section in your website, it should be stored here under public. ESLint is the configuration file for the linter where you can set your own rules. But like I said, we won't be using it. We have another git ignore, which excludes everything what we don't want to push to our repository. For example, the build folders or also the node modules. And then we have here an environment file from Next.js. This is automatically generated every time we build our project. This shouldn't be used to store our own types for TypeScript. If we want to store our own types, we need to create an additional file, call it for example, env.d.ts and store it in the root directory here. This is the configuration file for Next.js. Here we can set a different folder for the files which are created during the build process. Then we have here the package JSON files. Let's start with this one. So here we have the list of all dependencies we are using right now and the versions. We can see here we are using Tailwind CSS in the version 3.3. .3. And then we also can see all our building scripts and development scripts. We can also set here the name of our project as well as the version. The package log.json is basically a more detailed version of the package JSON. And it contains very detailed information about each dependency so like the exact version where it's from and so on. This is the configuration file for PostCSS, which is a tool to improve the development with CSS. We won't be using it in this tutorial. Then we have another readme file. Here we have the Tailwind config. Here we can set, for example, additional stylings for Tailwind, which are not available in Tailwind. For example, if we want to have an additional animation, we can declare it here, which we can then later use in our components with Tailwind code. This is the configuration file for TypeScript, which has all the settings for the compiler for TypeScript. As an example, we have here allow GSS is set to true. This means we can also have regular JavaScript files in this project, which is usable if you're migrating from JavaScript to TypeScript. Or for example, we have here strict is set to true, which means we can't assign an undefined value to a variable. We always have to initialize a variable with some kind of value. Then we have the source folder and inside of the source folder, there's also the app folder. This app folder has three files, the fev icon. This is basically the icon which we can see on the tab in the browser. Then we have the global CSS. Here we can see we have three directors of Tailwind, which basically tell Tailwind to transform any Tailwind code into regular CSS. Then we have here the layout TSX. This is basically the entry point of our next JS application. What we can see here is also we can set here the title of our next JS application. This is the title which we can see on the tab in the browser. Then we can also set the description. This is the description which we can see if we are looking, for example, with Google for a website and then we get a list of those websites and every website has like a short description what the website is about. And this is a layout. This is actually a specific kind of component in Next.js. I will get back to this layout TSX in a second. Here we have 
the page TSX. You could say this is the top level root and here we can see all the code which we can actually see on the web page of our next JS application. So if we run npn run dev again, all the text, all the links, the icons, they're right now all declared here in this page TSX. And like I said, page TSX represents also a special kind of component in Next.js. It's the top level root and the layout component is basically a UI that is shared across different routes and is not re-rendered if you change from a root to a different route. Also a layout shares its component state between different routes. So if you would have an input field and the input field uh, holds some string and you would change the root, then this input field wouldn't reset its value, it would keep it. Now let's make a quick example how to work with roots here in Next.js. I can create an additional root by creating a new folder. I will call it about. And in this about folder, I'm creating a new file, which is also again called page TSX. And then we simply write a function called about and return a simple diff with about in it. Then we need to export it. And this is already a new root. And if we go to our Next.js application, we can enter about, which will return our string about. Now this here is some styling which is declared in the global CSS. It's this gradient here, but yeah. So to summarize, the page component always renders all the components to a specific root, while the layout component always renders a UI that is shared between different routes and it won't be re-rendered if you change the root. And let's quickly change the content of our top level root. Let's create a simple diff here. So if we go back to our top level root, then we can see a home. If we go to about, then we get about. We can actually delete the readme and the git ignore here on the outside because we already have a git ignore and a readme in our portfolio project folder. Let's build the basic layout for our website. But first we need to go in the Tailwind configuration file and there we need to add the following line under content. This ensures we can use Tailwind in any of our components and it will be found no matter how nested our project structure is. I've already prepared a basic layout with a navbar, a hero section, an about section, a projects section, a services section and a footer. I've created a component folder in the app folder and also an additional folder layout where we can see those section components. So here we have the about section, which is a simple component with a simple diff container. We have set an ID, it's called about. When we set class name inside of the string, we are writing our Tailwind code, which is the styling. We set the flat box, set it to justify center and item center. This will center the string inside of our diff container. And we set the background to gray, then we also set the height to full screen, which means the height will be like the height of our screen. And we set also the text to white. We did the same for the hero section. Here we only set a different color. We also gave it an ID hero and the same for the project section as well as the services section. And also for the footer section. The footer section doesn't have an ID, but I will get to this in a second. And here we also set a padding for which translates to 16 pixels on each side. And then we also have the nav bar. And here we set a height of 14, which is 56 pixels. And we set the width to full. In the page component, we simply imported those components. It's surrounded by an empty tag. And we also imported the global CSS here. The next thing we are going to do is we add a basic navigation. So right now we can see here we have the nav bar and we want to have a few buttons or a few links. So if we click on the link, it will automatically scroll to the proper section. That's why I gave every section an ID. For the buttons in the navigation bar, we create our own component. So first we create a folder inside of the app folder and call it navigation. Then we create a component which is called menu item TSX. 
And this component has a parameter called title, which is a string, and it returns a simple link. If we click on the link, it will navigate to the next ID on our web page. For that, we need to make sure that we also have this hash followed by the ID name of each section. And we also need to make sure that the first letter of each ID is uppercase. In the navbar, we simply create three menu items. And there we set parameter, which is the title. And we set it to about, projects, and services. And those titles, they match the ID of those sections, for example, hero. So if we click on this button, it will automatically navigate to the proper section. We also need to add something in the global CSS, the scroll behavior on the very bottom, which will add a smooth scroll behavior. So in the end, we will have something like this. We have the three buttons about projects and services in the navigation bar. And if we click to projects, it will navigate to projects. If we click to services, it will navigate to services. And if we click to about, it will navigate to about. Now we're going to add some gradient as background and also a few transitions between those sections. We're going to use some vector graphics for that transition. And I've already prepared two of them, a gray variant and a variant with a gradient. The color need to match the gradient of the background. So the result looks like this, which looks pretty cool. You can also see here like a drop shadow. And this drop shadow is also part of this vector graphics. So to summarize, we have created a folder inside of the public folder and called in transitions. There we imported two of those vector graphics. The first one has a gradient, the second one only a solid color. And you can create your own transitions, your own vector graphics on the website getwaves.io with rectangular shapes, triangle shapes and so on. You simply click here, you click on copy the SVG code. Or actually, you can download the SVG and then you can import it. In Visual Studio Code, you can edit it. For the gradient, you have to add this linear gradient attribute. And inside of it, you have the first color and the second color. And then you also have this filter, which is the drop shadow. And make sure the preserve aspect ratio is set to none. And for the second one, we have also a drop shadow. And you also have to make sure that it's set to none here, but here we don't have a gradient. Then we have to add the same colors of the gradient into our Tailwind config. So we have to add a colors attribute and set gradient left with the first color and gradient right with a second color. So those colors have to match so that you get a seamless transition. Then we created for each section an outer div container where we set the actual background color. So for about, it's a solid color. It's BG Slate 800, which is a gray color. And we removed the background color from the inner div container. Inside of this outer div container, we also add our actual transition. It's the first element. And this transition contains actually their gradient. So the background color of our section is solid while the transition has a gradient. For hero, we don't have any transition element. We simply only have the background gradient. So BG gradient to right from the first color to the second one. For the project section, we also have the outer container. In this case, we have the gradient in the outer container. And the transition SVG is the one with a solid gray color. And for services, we have again the solid color on the outer div container and the transition SVG with a gradient inside of it. And the footer also has an additional outer div container with the background gradient from left to right and the transition vector graphics, which has the solid color. And one more thing, those vector graphics, they are rotated by 180 degree. So we have to set transform equals rotate 180 because if we download it from the website, it's actually facing to the top instead of the bottom. And that's basically it. As our next step, we're gonna adjust our navbar because right now if we scroll down, we don't have access to it anymore. And what we wanna do is that it always sticks here to the top and it's always accessible. And also if we scroll down, that it fades away. But if we hover with our mouse here on the top, then it should appear again. So this is the result. If we scroll down, the nav bar fades away, but it stays at the same location. So if we hover over the area where the nav bar was, it fades in again. And if we go with the mouse to the bottom again, it fades away again.
So let's have a look how this actually works in the code. We need to create an additional folder in the source folder and we call it hooks. In this folder, we are creating file and name it use scroll pos dsx. This is not a component, this is a custom hook. And what this hook does is it's measuring the distance to the very top of the window. So if we are scrolling down, then we have a different window position. And depending on the position of the window where we are currently, we are toggling a Boolean flag to true or false. So we are using the use state hook here, which is a Boolean, which is our flag. And then we are using the use effect hook from React because we are using the eventlessness from JavaScript, which is a side effect. We add the eventlessness scroll and this event is triggered every time with scroll. And it also triggers a function which we have set here it's called handle scroll and inside of this function we are setting the boolean flag depending on our position it checks the y value of the window if it's under 200 then it will be set true and if it's bigger than 200 it will be set to false and also we have a cleanup function here so every time the component is removed from the dom the event listener will be also removed now let's go to the navbar component in the navbar component we are simply accessing our custom hook and we are accessing the boolean value we also need to mark this component with use client because next.js supports three different render types it supports server-side rendering static side generation and also client-side rendering and per default everything will be rendered on the server but because we are using hooks from react hooks can only be used with client-side rendering and we are using our custom hook which is also using hooks of React, we need to this component with use client so it will be rendered on the client side. Then we added some additional styling here. So is a top is like I said, the flag. So if it's true, the opacity of our navbar is set to 100%. If it's false, it's set to zero, but also with the transition animation, which has a duration of 500 milliseconds. And this one here is a built-in animation of Tailwind. And also we add here what's happening when we are hovering over the navbar. So we are simply setting the opacity to 100. The transition animation will be also automatically added to this hover event. In addition to that, we are also setting sticky to this navbar, which basically tells the navbar that it remains at one position. We also are setting the Z value to 50 to ensure it's rendered before everything else. So we can always access it and always see it. And we also set top to zero and we set the margin top to 14 because sticky also adds an additional padding that we don't want. Now I added some additional styling to the navbar to make it look better. So we have a gradient here and we also adjusted the position of our elements here. So first I've added an additional div container around the menu items, set it as a flex box. Then I set a justify around inside of it and set the text size to 2xl and the width of the container to 50%. Then I also changed the background to a background gradient, which is simply BG gradient to R from transparent to black. And that's it. So this is what we are going to do next. This is how it will look like. We have our profile pic here. We have three icons, which are social media links. And we have this little nice fancy animation. So let's again dive into the code. For the social media icons, we first create a folder in the source folder and call it static. And there we create a component called social media. This component takes a parameter, which is a number, and we will have a div container. Inside of the div container, we have three of the icons. And let's focus on this one. You can see it's much bigger now. We have this black circle. Here we have the black background. Then the background is set to 50%. We also have a padding. And then we set rounded full, which makes the square, the div container, to a circle. And then we also add an animation from Tailwind. Every time we hover with a mouse over one of those icons, the scale increases. The standard scale is one or 100%. And we also apply transition all, so we have a smooth transition between those scales. And inside of this div container, of this black circle, we have an image. And there we simply add 
the link to the graphics, which is again a vector graphics. And also we add this vector graphics to our public folder again. We create a folder in it, call it icons. And there we have also all the other icons. To create any kind of icons, there's actually there's actually a nice website for it. It's called tailwindtoolbox.com slash icons. And we can already see a, a huge collection of different kinds of icons. We have here the code for the SVG, for the vector graphics. And they basically have everything. I think they also have the Twitter icon, but they have Facebook, what else? Instagram, TikTok maybe? No, they don't have TikTok. But GitHub and also LinkedIn. And we can just use this code choose also the color, the size, then we can simply create here an SVG file with a name, for example, GitHub, and then we just paste it here. That's how I created those three icons. And I set the stroke width to 1.25 and the color to white. And then we can use this icon here in our component. And for the image component, this is an image component from Next.js, we always have to set the width and the height. That's why this component has a parameter. So on the outer div container is simply a flex box with justify center and also a padding with the bottom set to four. And we also set gap two, which creates a gap between those icons. And then we also set a custom styling here, which is not available through Tailwind, where we say the pointer events are set to auto. This changes the cursor to this hand symbol every time we hover over it. That's all for the social media bar. For this animation, we need to use an additional library. This library is called React Type Animation. So we simply have to install it npm i React Type Animation. And then we create the typing component in the static folder. And this is how it works. It's pretty simple. You can see here we have a sequence, and the sequence is an array. And we can set a list of strings which should appear. So I have here four strings next.js, TypeScript, Tailwind, CSS. React.js, it can be like 10 strings, it's up to you. And here we say how fast it should change. In this case, it's 500 milliseconds. Then it will switch to the next one. Speed is the speed of the typing animation, it's set to 10 right now. And pre-render first string means the first time we enter the page, the first string is already rendered, it's not animated, which can improve the performance. Then we also set some custom stylings. We only want to repeat it in this case once. You can see it here. The animation will run the first time. So we have four strings. This is the fourth one. And then it will repeat once. And then it stops. And I think if it's not defined, it will run forever. With that, we can look at our hero section. Let's close this for a moment and we did some changes to the div container. So we set the min height to the full height of the screen. Then we set a padding on the X axis to 20. We also centered the items. This one we can actually delete because we won't be needing it because it's only one div container here. In the inside, we have now an additional div container which has the content, the text and the image. So the inner div container is set Again, as a flex box, it's set to flex row. This is one div container and this is another one. So it should be organized horizontal, not vertically. And then we set the width to 100% and flex one. Okay, actually we can remove this. Even better, makes the code even more easy to read and understand. Then we have here another div container. The first one here contains the text and the second one is simply the image. And so we set the width of the image to 40%. We set it to object contain and it's self-centered. We also add an animation here and customized animation, which we have to declare in the Tailwind configuration file. In the Tailwind configuration file under extent, we have to add an attribute called animation. And there we set the name of the animation, scale pulse. And this animation should last eight seconds with a transition of easy in out and it should loop forever. Then we also need to set the keyframes. So again, we set the attribute scale pulse. This can be any name. So at 0%, it should scale to one. At 50%, it should scale to 1.5. 
0.5 and at 100% it should scale to 1 again. With this we basically define the animation. Here in the animation we say how long it should loop and how it should transition between those different states. We also add a new color which is the bluish color which we can then use in our component. Let's have a look at the text, at the actual text. So this is again a flexbox and because we have also in this one several container we set it to flex column. Those containers here will be organized in the column. We set also the pointer events to none. If we hover with the mouse over the text it won't change. And then we set the text to white and the width to 60%. And then we have here the text. And what I can recommend, this is for responsive design. I wouldn't set the text to a pixel value. I can recommend to set it to the viewport width. Because if it's set to pixel, then it's fixed. The issue is for different devices, you have to set different pixel values. And this one is setting the text size dynamically based on the width of the screen. In most cases, it will appear as the same size which is awesome you don't have to define anything else so in this case it will automatically scale up the font and we do the same with the next text here but it's a bit smaller and then we add here our typing animation here we have another div container with the social media icons it's again a flex box at the top margin it's set to justify start so it's located here and not in the middle or on the right and we also set with dynamically. We set the icon size to 200 so the icons will also scale with the width of the viewport. And of course because we are using hooks again from React we need to mark this component to be rendered on the client side. As our next feature we are going to implement the burger menu which allows us to navigate through our web application on mobile devices. Now right now we are in the desktop mode and if we change the width of our browser window. Like this we can already see here the burger menu demonstrated once again. Here we have the regular navbar and this is the burger menu for mobile devices. If we click on it this window appears and we have our menu items and also the social media icons. And if we click on X then it disappears again. So let's dive into the code again. I made some small changes to the project structure. I've created a folder which is called menu and inside of it I've created a burger menu component and another folder called element. Inside of elements there are four components burger, close, menu and menu item. What I've changed is we had the menu item in a separate folder called navigation and now I simply moved this component here into this elements folder. So let's start with those elements components. The first one is called burger. It's only some styling. This represents the burger menu icon, which we can see here. This is simply the burger menu icon with the animation. And it's a button container, which is set to relative. It has some padding. Actually, this one we can simplify because it's the same padding on X and Y. Then we set the background color, we set the background opacity to 50% and we add some rounded edges. Inside of it we have an additional div container which is set to absolute. It's also centered inside of the button container vertically and horizontally. We set the Z index to 50 to ensure that it's always clickable. Inside of this div container we have three more div containers which are simply white div boxes which represent the bars we can see here. And we also add an animation from Tailwind. So this is already pre-configured from Tailwind and we don't have to code anything. We can simply call it. The next one is the close component. So that's this icon here. And it's again only styling. It's a button container set to relative Z index to 50 to ensure that it's always clickable. Again we can change this because it's the same padding on X and Y. The opacity is set to 50. We add Added some rounded edges and add the background color. And inside of it we have again two div boxes. They are pretty similar to the div boxes of the burger menu icon with the exception that they are rotated by 45 degree. The first one is rotated clockwise by 45 degree and the second one anti-clockwise. This way we create the X. So those div boxes are actually stacked on top of each other. 
Then we have here a menu component, which simply has a few menu item components in it, which are initialized with about work and services. And this is the menu item which we have created previously. Then we have here the burger menu component, which is a bit more complex. So let's start with this line here. We have here again a custom hook. It's called use global state. It already implies this is some global state management. And for the global state management, we are using the context API, which comes with React. We have here one state and two functions. So let's have a look at this custom hook first. To create the custom hook, we have created a folder called context. And inside of it, we create a file called global state context. So in order to access our context, which has the global states, we first need to create a context, a global state context, and we initialize it with undefined. We also give it a type global state, which we have defined in an additional file, which is called types.d. So for this file, we have created a types folder and in it the following file. And there we create an interface called global state, set three attributes. The first one is called is menu open, which is a simple Boolean. The next one is toggle menu, which represents presents a function and the third one is also a function which is called exit menu. And in this case we set it to undefined because otherwise we have to initialize the global state. So then we create our use global state hook of type global state. In order to consume the states we use the function use context and assign our global state context to it. Then we have here the global state provider. It has some parameters, actually only one parameter, which is called children. Inside of the global state provider, we set the actual global states. The first one is a use state and it has a is menu open and set menu open, which is a Boolean. And the second one is toggle menu, which is a function which simply toggles the Boolean, for example, a Boolean of true, it will toggle it to not true, which is false, or if it's false, it will toggle it to not false, which is true. The second function simply sets the Boolean always to false. We create a variable of type global state, we initialize it with the Boolean use state and those two functions. In order to access the global states from any component in our project, we need to wrap the provider around it. And you might ask yourself why we have here a parameter called children and then simply pass it here. This is a nested component. And in the page component, we are actually wrapping the provider around all other components. And this syntax is a different way how to pass the parameters. We can actually also call the children property and pass the components manually in an array. React automatically recognize it. And with this syntax, it automatically pass all the children as parameters to the global state provider component, which then again wraps the actual provider around the children. So it makes the use state and those two functions accessible to all our components in the project. So that's for the global state management. Let's go back to the burger menu component. Let's continue with the return statement first. We have another div container here and we can see here desktop. This is customized, which we have to define in the tailwind config. And here we set another attribute called screens under theme and assign mobile to it, which has a key value pair max and the value 1023 pixels. The second value is desktop, which a key value pair of min and the value is 1024 pixels. Whenever we call this, it will activate this styling as long the conditions are met. So the condition here is the styling hidden is active as long the width of the browser window is at least 1024 pixels. If this would be mobile, the conditions would be uh, this is active as long the width is smaller than 1023 pixels. And with those two attributes, we basically can manage the responsive design in our entire application. Then we have here another div container, which is set to fixed and it's placed in the top right corner. Top is set to zero and right is set to zero also. Then we have a padding. The Z index is again set to 50 to ensure that it's accessible all the time. When we click on it, it triggers a function, the toggle menu function, which 
toggles the boolean of our use global state hook. Inside of the div, we check the is menu open state. If it's true, then we show the close component. If it's false, we show the burger component. Then in the next part, we are also checking if the menu is open. Depending on the state, we are showing the actual menu. So this is the div box, the transparent div box with the menu and the social media icons. So this one here, it's a flex box again with justify set to between, padding top to 20 and it's also fixed. Then we have flex column, which will position our both components vertically. We set the text color to white, then also the text size to 4XL. Again, we set padding left to five, the background color to black, and we also add a blur filter to medium and the background opacity to 40. So this results in a transparent blurry background. And also we set the width to full to 100% and the height to 100%, the Z index to 40. So it's still accessible, but the burger menu buttons should be accessible before everything else. Then we have here the use effect hook. Again, we are checking here if the menu is open. If it's open, we are simply saying that we add this styling here, so which removes the scrolling feature from our web application. I have no scroll bar here and I can't scroll at all. If I click on the X, I can scroll again. If I go into the burger menu, I can't scroll again. This simply adds this styling when the menu is open and it removes it when the menu is closed. Otherwise, you could also scroll if the menu was open, which can result in a weird behavior. We'll also add an event listener, which triggers the function exit menu from our use global state hook, which simply sets the menu open state to false. And we also remove it when this burger menu is not rendered anymore. This ensures that the burger menu is only active when we want it to be active. Without it, it could happen that if we have opened up the burger menu and we are maximizing the window, it would be still rendered together with a regular navbar for the desktop mode. And that's something we don't want to have. With any resizing, the menu is automatically closed. And that's about it. With the burger menu finished, we can focus on the other sections. We're going to continue with the about section. So this is how it will look like. We click on about. We have the about section and we have a little text about ourselves. And on the right, we have a timeline. This timeline is dynamically created, which means it reads a JSON with and JSON array, each item of the array contains one position. And in the position, we have the info about the tasks, the technologies they were used, and the date, the title of the position, and also the company. And you can change it to whatever you want. For example, if you have five entries, it will automatically create five of those points and show them here in the about section. So let's dive into the code. First of all, what has changed? We have here two additional components. Summary component, which is a static component which contains the text we have seen. And the timeline component, which generates the timeline with the entries out of a JSON. What's important is the ID about. It was previously in this inner div. Now it's here on the outer div. Also, there was an attribute called height full screen. We have to delete that one. This ensures that the height will fit the content. Otherwise, it will fit the screen and we will have a lot of unused empty space. So what's new is this div container here, which is a flex box. It's set to flex row and full width flex row because we have two components which should be aligned horizontally. And each of those components has its own div container where we specify the width of those containers. So here we also make use of our responsive attributes. So in desktop mode, this div container should be half the size of the screen. And in mobile mode, it should use the full width. It also adds an additional padding around it in mobile mode. Then it's also set to flex column. In desktop mode, we have also set the padding to 20 here. 
For the second div container, it's also set to flex in desktop mode and also like the other container, the width is set to half. Flex column again and a padding left. Here we have something else. In mobile view, it's set to hidden. So this timeline won't be visible in mobile mode. So if we change the width, you can see we can only see the text, the summary. In desktop mode, this timeline appears. Let's have a quick look at the summary component. In statics, I created an additional component called summary. Like I said, it's only some static code. So we have here a P tag, which is the headline about me. And we set the text size and also we add margin bottom to it. Then we have an article section where we again set the text size, depending on in which mode we are. If we are in desktop mode, then we set it to text XL and in mobile mode, we set it to text MD. Then we have another P tag container where we set a margin bottom to five and we simply have the text here and that's about it. Now the timeline component is a bit more complex. It's also in the static folder. Let's have a look at it. So first of all, we are importing our JSON, which contains all the information for our timeline. And this JSON is stored in the public folder under data. And it's simply called timeline JSON. It looks like this. It's an object which has an attribute data and the data is an array of three objects. And each object has the attributes, title, company, tasks, tags, and year. And here we set all the information. You can add here as many entries as you want. This will automatically read from the timeline component and the timeline component will generate all the bullet points. Let's have a look at the timeline component. So we are importing the data from our JSON and we have here a simple div container again, where we set the text size to XL. And then we are iterating over it with map. There we create a div container for each item. And we also give it a key. And we set this div container also as a flex box. Inside of this one, we are creating another div container, also a third one. Now this is the actual circle, which we can see here. What we can see here are two div containers. It's actually a trick. This one is the outer div container, which is a gray circle. The text color is set to white. The border is set to rounded full. It has a width and height of 80 pixels. And also everything in this div container should be centered vertically and horizontally. Then inside of it, we are creating a smaller div container, which is also a circle again. And it has a different background color. This background color actually matches the background color of our web page. Those two are identical which gives the illusion that we simply created a border around the text. This one is slightly smaller. So here we have a height and width of 72 pixels. We set the font weight to bold. And again, we set justify center and item center. And here we also set the year, which we have from our JSON. In the next line, this is the bar, which we could see previously. I uncommend it here again. And let's have a quick look at it. Uh, for that, I also need to uncommand the bottom div container. So this is the bar and it's simply a div box, which is set to height full. So it adjusts automatically depending on the height of this div container. So it's adjusting in relation of the height of the content of this div container. And the background color is gray, the width is set to one. And also here, because we don't want to have a bar for every item, we only want it if there is also a next item available. So if we remove here the one, it will create this additional bar, which we don't want because here we don't have any entries anymore. Otherwise it simply creates a diff with a height of 16, which represents 64 pixels. Okay, let's check out this div container, which has all the content. This is a flex box again, which is set to flex column because we have here three div containers, which should be aligned vertically. So this is one div container. This is another one. And this is the third one and they are aligned vertically. The first one only contains the title which we get out of the JSON. And also we set here the font weight to bold and we have here an additional span element. Here we set 
the data of the company and we set here also a different color. The second div container simply outputs the tasks out of the JSON and the third one is a special one. To render the tags we create an unordered list which is again flexbox and we set it to flex wrap so all those items of the list will be rendered in a row and if the width of the row is not enough it will be rendered in the next line and here we set the label of the list inside of it we are iterating over this array from the json with map again we set the individual items of this list we give each item a key set a right margin and the top margin and here we simply create the tag with the title which we have from the json again so this is the tag component. It's a simple component which takes a parameter, the title, and it has a simple div container which is set to flex. It's, we set item center, give it rounded borders and specific background color, some padding on, on the X and Y axis. And we set the font size and also the font weight. We also set the line height and the text color. And that's it for the timeline component. With that being finished, we're gonna move forward to the project section. In the end, we will have something like this. So we can see here three project cards. Each project card has its own image, a headline, a small description, and those tags which describe which technologies were used for this project. Now this is dynamic, dynamically created. All the data, the link to the image, they are stored in the JSON. You can add as many entries as you want and they will automatically be shown here in the project section. So let's have a look at the code. First we have to create the JSON. So we have to create a new JSON file in the public folder under data and call it projects. There we have this simple json which is an array that contains three objects and each object has the attributes title image link tags and the text now the images will be stored also in the public folder under the folder images those are the images which we have seen on the project section now make sure that those images are using their web format and that they are optimized so that you can get the best possible performance now for the project card, we have to create a new component in the static folder. This one is simply called project. It has five parameters, which take all the information of the JSON. So the headline, the image, the text, the text, and the link, which then will be visualized in the project card. So this component is a link. If we click on it, it will forward us to any site which you have added to your JSON file. So it can be a Git repository, it can be the actual website, it's up to you. So inside of the link, we have another div container, which represents the actual card. And it's set as a flexbox again, and it has a hover animation. So the standard scale is set to 100. And if we hover over it, the scale is set to 105. And we set the transition animation to all. This comes with Tailwind and will automatically add this hover effect to it. Then we also set the background opacity to 20, the background color to black, and we add some rounded edges. We set the max width to 384 pixels. We add some margin around it and we also set the text to white. Also we set here the max height to max content if we are changing the width of the website. So in most cases it will remain a square. In the special case we have a smartphone with a very small screen. We want to make sure that those cards are still rendered correctly and the height adjusts itself to the content. So the content will still remain inside of this div container and not outside. That's why we have to define max content here. Inside of this div container, we have the image. We set it to fit, fit content, and also the height to fit content. And we add some round edges, but only on the top corners because the rounded corners of the outer div, they don't affect the actual image. So we have to add additional 
rounded edges to this image here. Then we set here also the max height again. Uh, actually, we can remove one of those attributes. Yeah, we set the max height to 256 pixels. We add the source of the image and also give it a description. Then we have the bottom div container, which contains all the text. So let's have a look at this. So this is the outer one, which has a padding around it. And then inside of it, we have another div container for the headline where we set the font size, the font weight, and also some margin. Then in the next line, we have the description. And then we have, again, the unordered list, which we already had in the timeline. And it has exactly the same logic. And that's all for the project card. Then we simply need to add this project component in our projects section. Here we simply have to do a few adjustments. So first we are adding this headline. We set again it to Flexbox, set the text font, the add some margin bottom to it and also some margin top to it. Actually we can simplify this because it's both on the X axis on the y axis not on the x axis and then we also set it to justify center we set the text color to white and font weight to 700. Here we set a div container which handles the responsive design of the project cards. It's a flex box and it's set to flex wrap. It also should use the full available width. So with flex wrap, we say we want to render it in a row if it's possible. And if not, it should render those project cards on top of each other. So if we have a look at here, we have here enough space. So all those cards will be rendered in one row. But if this change, they are rendered vertically and with even a bit more space. So here, two of those cards fit in the row, but the third one is already too much, so it will be rendered in the next row. With enough space, everything will be rendered in one row. And this is a very easy concept to create a simple responsive design. And in desktop mode, we also add some padding. Actually, this is padding which is only applied on the x-axis, so we can simplify it and set it to px20. It will have the same effect here we are simply iterating over the JSON, which has all our data. For each entry, we create a project card, give it a key, and we pass our parameters to it. As our next task, we will improve the responsive design of the hero section. Right now, the structure remains the same, no matter the screen size, but on smaller screens, this structure doesn't look good and it's not readable. In the end, we will have something like this. So the profile pic will be rendered first and it's centered. And under the profile pic, we have the font, which is also centered. The social media icons are hidden here. For that, we have to do a few adjustments in the hero section. So we go to the hero component. We set the padding on the X axis to 20 for the desktop mode. And for mobile, we set it to six on each axis. Then and in the inner div container, we set justify center only in the mobile mode. And in the desktop mode, we set it to flex row. Also, we set items center in the desktop mode. And important for the mobile mode, we set flex call reverse. This changed the order of the div containers. Right now, the profile pic is the second element in the div container and the text is the first. In the mobile mode, it's the first element and the text is the second. So this is the container with the text. Here we simply say that in desktop mode, it should use the width of 60% and in mobile mode, it should use the full width. Also in mobile mode, the text is centered. Then we change the font size depending on the mode. So in the desktop mode, we set a smaller font size and in the mobile mode, we set actually a bigger font size. And the same goes for the next line here. For the social media icons, we simply set the div box to hidden when it's in mobile mode. For the portrait, we set the width to full in mobile mode and we also limit the max width for the profile pic. We are nearly finished with the content. The last thing we need to do is the service section and the footer. Both are pretty straightforward. We only have here some static content. So we have some text, we have some div boxes and some SVG icons. And in the footer, we are showing again the social media icons as well as the copyright with 
the current date. We also have some hover animation here and that's about it. So let's have a look at the code. For the services, we create a new component inside of the static folder. We call it simply service. The service component takes a parameter, which is a custom type, which we have defined in the types file. Service data is simply a new interface with the headline, a description and the image. Then we have a simple div box again, which is a flex box. We set the min height to 100%. We set it to flex column because we have here three container. They should be aligned vertically again. In desktop mode, we set the width to one third because we have three elements, three services. And like I said, it's static, it's not dynamically. So each element will use one third of the screen. Then we add some mar margin and in mobile mode, we set the width to 75%. We add also some padding around it and some rounded edges. The hover effect is a change in the background color and we add the transition colors, which automatically adds some linear transition animation to it. Like I said, we have those two modes again. Here, each element takes only a third, a third of the width because it's in the desktop mode and in the mobile mode, it takes 75%. The image takes again two thirds of the width. We set the height to auto and it's self-centered. We also add some padding and then we set the image. In the next line, we simply have the headline where we set the font weight to 700 and we also set the font size. And for the description, we add some, some top margin and we also set some font size to it. And that's all for the service component. The icons are again stored in the public folder under icons. So we have here those three icons. There are actually a lot of open source icons available through Figma. And I found this collection with 4,000 free icons online. It's from Streamline. And there you can simply zoom in. Those are all vectorized graphics and you can click on one of them. Uh, you can change the color and here on the bottom right, you can simply export it. You can change it to PNG or SVG, whatever you want, and then you can download it and import it into your web app. That's how I did it here. The last thing we need to do is we need to go into the in the services component in the layout folder. And there we adjust the headline of, of the services section. We give it a justify center. We make it a flex box, set the font size to 4XL, add some, some bottom margin and some top margin. This is again something we can simplify. Then justify center, we set the text color to white and we also set the font weight. Here we add an additional flex box, which follows a similar principle than the project section. So in desktop mode, we have flex row. So everything will be rendered in a row and in the mobile mode, it will be rendered in a column. And we also want in the mobile mode that everything is centered. And we also set flex scroll, then justify around and that the text is also centered. And then we simply add the individual service component where we give the information about each service as parameter. So here we have the headline, the description and the image. Here we simply add this text. We make sure that we have two different font sizes for the mobile and desktop view. So it looks good in both modes. And then we set the font weight again to 700, the text center, and we also add a margin bottom. So far, so good. Let's have a look at the footer. So here in the footer, we have added a footer container, which we set as a flex box and we set flex column, item center, add an additional div container in it, which contains the social media icons component, where we set the size to 35. And we also add a top padding to it. Okay, we can actually remove this. And then here we have simply the copyright. This is a JavaScript function. So new date and get full year. This will automatically always add the current date. So you don't have to set it manually. And here we simply have the text all rights reserved. And this is the copyright symbol. Text color is white, then it's also centered and we add some padding around it and it's also set as a flex box and that's all for the content now we're going to add this animated indicator here if we click on it it will move us to the about section 
For the indicator, we have to create a new component, which simply is called arrow inside of static. It contains two diff boxes, which have a styling so that it looks like a arrow. So we have set the width and the height, and we set the right border width and also the bottom border width. Then we rotate it by 45 degree, and we add a customized animation, which we have defined in the Tailwind config. Then we also add some rounded edges. The next box is the same. So we have two arrows here. We add here also some styling which is not available through Tailwind. This simply delays the animation for the second arrow. So let's have a look at the animation in the Tailwind config. We have created here a new property which is called move fade. We set the animation duration that it's linear and that it also should loop forever. Inside of keyframes we set how this animation looks like. So at 0% we set the opacity to 0 and we reset the position of the arrow. Also we always have to set the rotation to 45 degree otherwise it will reset it to 0 degree. At 50% we set the opacity to 1. At 100% we set it to 0 again. We rotate it again by 45 degree and we move the arrow a bit down. And this will loop forever. Then in the hero section under layout here we have to create a new div container which we set in desktop mode to absolute and we also set the position to bottom. In mobile mode we set it as a flex container and we set inset 0 and items end. We add some padding on the y-axis and we also center it horizontally and here we set the z index to 10. Inside of this div container we create a link and we set the id to about and also the label and inside of the link we simply place the arrow component. Now let's add the contact form. We can already see it here in the top right. If we click on it this model opens up. We can enter some details and the message and if we click on send message it, it will send it to an email which we have defined in the code. For the contact button we create a new component inside of menu and then in elements it's simply called contact button and it has a parameter called title. It also uses the use global state and has access to is modal open, toggle modal function and the exit menu function. Then we create here a function which simply calls both the functions of the use global state followed by an use effect and in this use effect we simply check if the modal is open and in this case we again add the styling which removes the scroll bar and if this is not rendered anymore then we remove the styling. And at last we have here the button we, which we set to flex then item center and we add the cursor pointer attribute inside of the button we create the div container give it a label and add the animation if we hover over it so it's a transition animation which is set to easy in out and the duration is 300 milliseconds we also center the text give it a border width of two then the border color of white and we add some rounded edges to it some padding on the x-axis on the y-axis and if we hover over it, the background color is white and the text is black. If the button is clicked, it will trigger the handle click function, which is defined here. Now you can already see we have here a new function and also a new state. We have to define those in our use global state hook. And inside of the global state provider, we simply create a new use state and name it is model open and set model open. Then we add an additional toggle function which simply toggles this use state and we also add a function which sets the use state always to false. We also have to add those functions and states in our global state interface. So here we have exit modal which is the function then toggle modal and also is modal open. In menu item we also add an additional feature. So here we add a function which is triggered when we click on the menu item and it's simply the exit menu function from our use global state. So if we are in the mobile view and we have the burger menu then we click on one of those menu items and it should automatically close the menu. That's the idea behind it. So let's have a look at the actual contact form. For that we also have to create a new component inside of static and we simply call it contact. For the contact form I use this existing form from Flowbyte. Here we can access the code, we 
simply copy that and paste it. Now we're gonna remove those two lines here, which are simply the headlines we have here because we won't be needing it. And we also do a few adjustments. So we set this outer section container to fixed and, and then we also center it. So we set top to 50 and left to 50 and then translate on the X axis and also translate on the Y axis. This will center it vertically and horizontally. Then in desktop mode, the width is limited to one third of the screen and in mobile mode, we use the full width. Also in mobile mode, we add some padding on the X axis and we limit it. The rest of it remains the same. You can already see a, a link. Form Submit is a website which offers a service. Let's have a look at that. So with Form Submit, I can I can use the backend of this web page and I don't have to implement any code. So what you simply have to do is you enter this link and then you replace this with your own email and then you send once a message with this form. After that, you will receive an email from Form Submit where you have to activate your account and they will give you a unique ID so that you can replace your actual email in the code with that ID. And from that on, the form is usable. We can have a quick look how this looks like. So if I enter some details here, subject inquiry and test message, then I click on send. I have to confirm that I'm not a robot and my message is sent. And this is how it looks like if you receive the email. So you can see here the email of the sender, then also the subject and the actual message. Then we also have to create a new component inside of the layout folder inside of components and layout, which is simply called model. And this component accesses also the is modal open state and the exit modal function from our use global state hook. In the return statement, we simply check if the model is open. And depending on that, we show the close component and around it, we again have a diff box. It, it's the same logic than in the burger menu. And this close component should also trigger the exit model function from our use global state hook. In the next line, we have the diff box with the black background color and which has a blur filter to it. It's also again the same logic than we have with the burger menu. And inside of this diff container, we simply add the contact form and that's it. We then have to add this model in our page component inside of app. Also in the service section, at the end of the component, we simply add the contact button in the menu for the burger menu inside of menu elements and menu. We add again also the contact button here. Now we are finished with our website. We need to push all of our changes to the Git repository, which we have created in the beginning. So I've already did it. So you have to enter, first you have to change to the project folder, which is called portfolio then simply enter git status and then you can see all the changes you've made and git add to add all of those changes you can simply do it again so git status right now i have no more changes only those deleted files here then with git add i can add all my changes and then i write a simple commit message and i push it to the repository now, if you have created your Git repository for the first time, it can happen that it will ask you for your login credentials. And you have to make sure that you also have created a Git token. You create the token by going to your Git repository. You click here on the top right on your profile icon, click here on settings. Then you scroll down to the very bottom. Here you have developer settings. And here you can create your personal access token. And then you simply generate a new token. You have to authenticate yourself. It's a very long string, which will only appear once. You have to save it somewhere. Every time you are logging in here into the into GitHub over the terminal, you have to also enter the token. Now our project is pushed to our repository and we want to deploy it now on Versal. So you have to create a new account on Versal. If everything is set up, you go to add new, add a new project, and then you can add it 
from the Git repository. You might need to adjust the permissions for the repository. And then you select the repositories which should have the permission. So in my case, it's Next.js template. And then I click on Save. Now it will be shown here and I can simply import it. So the framework preset is Next.js. Here we go. The root directory is, we have to edit it. Yeah, it's in portfolio. And then we simply click on deploy. This will take a few minutes. And now it's done. It will automatically forward you to this page here, to this preview page. And you can simply click on it. Yeah, there it is. Congratulations. So thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.